Okay, good afternoon, everyone. This is yours truly, Mr. Kevin L.A. Ewing, with another teaching uh, for you guys uh, today. As usual, it is a pleasure and a privilege to be in your company. But as usual, give me one second to make sure all of my levels are up and that we're not having any audio or video uh, interruptions. Okay, <clears throat> so while my numbers are climbing, we're just going to run with our regular tests. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so everything is fine. YouTube, Facebook. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, good. So we're at 68. We're going to let it climb up to about 500 before we get started. And I trust that you guys are doing safe. Today we have a very, 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 very good teaching uh, today. Uh, the title is called God's Divine Invisible, Invisible Protection. And it is my uh, attempt today to uh, look at the many layers of spiritual or invisible protection that God has afforded us. And unfortunately, we don't hear much about this protection. But today I'm going to walk you through those layers of protection and how you are responsible for enabling this protection. It's there with you all the time. And the more you uh, make yourself cognizant of this protection, the more you will see how much our God not only cares for you, but it is his desire to consistently not just protect you. And this is what I love about it. The protection is just limited to you. But because of your belief in God and accepting his son as your savior, then the umbrella of that protection extends beyond you, all right? And this is powerful. This is something that you really, really need to know because the whole idea of these teachings is to get you to engage the Word of God and not the uh, stuff that we just hear that has absolutely no spiritual backing. All right, so we're at 371. Again, we're waiting to hit 500. Okay, I see Missy Corey Brown. I see you, Sharon Bins, uh huh, Beth Abara, Taylor Key, Charles Jackson, Monisha Eugene, ZZ, Catherine Major Forbes. I see you guys, uh, Alan. Kanzaga, I think it is. <laughs> I hope I pronounced it right. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming on board. I appreciate you coming. Uh, Marilyn Boykins. Uh, mm -hmm. Rochelle Boher, I think it is. All right. Wendy Johnson. Uh, Teresa Howe, I think that is. Uh, Sharon Sharp. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Maya Morin, Jules Robinson. I see you guys. Thank you for, for joining the, the broadcast. We had 432. We're almost at our 500 mark. Once we get there, we'll start this awesome teaching. Bernadette Court, I see you. Shandell Adderley Swain. Shandell, we need to talk. <laughs> You're supposed to, to connect and we will. <laughs> Probably right after this this uh, recording. Okay. All right. All right. Where are we now? 442 and counting. All right. Nancy Barfield. I see that. Okay. Uh, Wendy Burke. Cohen Majestic. Blessed Harris. Bernadette Court again. See that again. 454 and climbing. I trust you guys are having an excellent day. I don't know about you, man, but I'm so always excited about the Word of God, and uh, more so I like the fact that, you know, when you know you're walking in what you are called to do, I don't think there's no greater pleasure than that, and you're, you're doing it because you love it, and when you see the results of what it brings, it encourages you more, encourages you even more to continue doing what you do, and this is why every now and again I encourage you guys to you know, ask God, what is it that you call me to do? What is it that you call me to sing? Did you call me to teach? Did you call me to encourage? Did you call me to help, to assist? What is it? You will never be fully satisfied in life 
even after you've accepted Jesus Christ, until you begin to walk into why you were placed here. What is your reason for being here? Okay, because with that comes a major responsibility in that this is your contribution to your existence. So on the day of judgment, when God judges you, he's going to judge you based on what you were supposed to contribute as a result of your calling, your gifts, your talents. What did you do? This is very important. A lot of people who are kind of successful in some areas of their life, but it's not their calling. It's not their gift. It's not their talent. They may went to school and learn how to do certain things, and they're good at that. And, and they could be doing something good, but not what they are called to do. That is also a tragedy because, again, <laughs> you're not going to be judged on what you did that was good, but more so what you were supposed to be doing that God specifically assigned to you to bring a benefit to other people. So it does my heart, it does my heart so good to see, even like now, you know, or the nowhere I just decided to pop up and start a teaching. And here it is, we're climbing up in numbers of people eagerly ready to come on, but not for me, the word of God that they want. And that's how it should be with you, whether it's singing, whatever it is. There are people that God has assigned to you. You don't even notice yet because of what he has invested in you. And many people are in churches trying so hard to, to be someone else, trying to imitate their partners and their, sorry, their pastors and apostles and trying to speak like them and trying to literally be them. And they have no idea that there are two people that they're cheating here. They're cheating themselves, but more importantly, because they're not moving in what they're called to do and pretending to be somebody else, they're cheating the people whom God has assigned to be privy to the gift, to activate the gift in those people's lives. So this is why I find it so important. God, what is it? What is it that you have called me to do? What is it that you want me to do? Who am I supposed to minister to or speak to or what is it that you're going to say through me when I do open my mouth and declare your word only to activate or convict uh, something in somebody else's life? All right. So that's very, very many people who are very talented too. They're talented and some of them are moving in the gift, but they become haughty and arrogant and start charging you and all kind of nonsense. And what it's doing is polluting the gift. All right. I'll tell you this last point before I get off of this topic. One of the best way to discover what you are called to do, or if you know what you are called to do, how is how do you enhance, how do you bring out of you what God has called you to do? What is the fuel to that gift? The word of God. <laughs> Sounds simply, yeah. If you are called to teaching, if you are called to preaching, if you are called to singing, if you are called to the ministry of finance or whatever you're called to, the fuel to your calling is God's word. Consistently read the word of God. Consistently expose yourself to sound biblical teaching. And you watch, you watch, because what you're doing, remember, the gift is embedded in your spirit, your soulish spirit, soul man. And like I always say, just how physical food fuels or refuels your physical being. And you don't know when you, when you eat a, a, a plate of food, you know, you're not looking at that plate and say, okay, the, the rice have this and that. And so I'm going to eat a lot of this so I can get this mineral in, and I'm going to divide it up in my body. No. Once you would have ate that food, the body takes over from there in distributing the minerals, the vitamins, and so on to the various parts of the body that needs it to re-energize itself. And it's the same thing as your gift. When you have a gift, like myself, for example, I, I'm a teacher. I, God has given me the revelation to see beyond just the words on the Bible and take me deeper into the word. But that came about or that is enhanced through my constant reading or constant listening to the sound doctrine of God from others. And in that, then stuff began to just come at you, different scenarios. You see it from a different angle. You read this for years, but you never saw this part of it. Then the Holy Spirit take you to another scripture that supports what that is saying, but even bringing more highlight to it. Is this me doing this on my own? No, it's me going back to my fueling station, which is the word of God, 
to be re-energized to continue with the revelatory insight of the scriptures that God has given me, not for me, but for his people. And this is why I cannot put a price tag on something that was given to me as a gift, not for me to parade around with, but to give freely to his people. And that is what uh, God requires of all of us. Okay, so we are at 729. And again, our topic today is God's invisible, uh, sorry, <laughs> God's divine invisible uh, protection. All right. All of you who are on here that have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, there are layers of, I want to be clear, invisible or unseen or spiritual protection that, that has been afforded you. In fact, let me put it this way. You have more protection on your life than President Biden in America has physically in terms of CIA, all of these other people. And the, 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 the advantage, I would call it, of your protection is that it's unseen. But the scriptures I'm going to take you in today is to bring a highlight or an awareness to you so that you could now uh, enforce this protection based on your knowledge of the layers of protection that God has already afforded you. Okay, so I want us to go to a very, very powerful scripture on this invisible protection. So I want us to go to Job, Job chapter 1, okay? Job chapter 1, and I want us to read uh, Job chapter 1 all the way to verse, verse uh, well, I'll just continue to read until I decide to stop. Okay, so let me pull it up here on my device. Let's go to Job chapter 1. All right. This is going to be very, very powerful today. Job chapter 1, okay. This thing trying to play the fool with me today. Devil, you are a liar, and your pants is on fire. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Job, Job chapter 1. Okay. Here we go. Job chapter 1. All right. Good. Job chapter 1, and we're going to read from verse 6. That's what it is. Yes. Job chapter 1, and we're going to read from verse 6. Now, listen to this carefully. Because what we're about to read here is spirit-filled, meaning that the characters, the majority of characters in this story, I want you to be clear here now, the majority of characters in this story are invisible characters. And during the discourse or the conversation between God and Satan, who are the spiritual beings in this story, and the conversation being centered around a human, which is Job, well, through the discourse between God and Satan, Satan is going to reveal some, some spiritual revelation that we would have never known had he not said it in this particular conversation. All right? So I want you to be cognizant of that. So in Job chapter 1, verse 6, it says, Now there was a day, okay, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. So when we hear uh, the sons of God, we're not; these are not human beings. These are spiritual beings, okay? And apparently God had a, a conference or a conclave, and there was this meeting. So the Bible is saying that not only were the sons of God present, at this meeting by God, but Satan, all right, also showed up, all right? Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan, this is powerful, Satan, which is a spiritual being, so was God, so was the sons of God, and Satan came also among them. Verse 7 of Job 1 says, And the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou, or where did you come from? How did Satan respond? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. 
Okay? Verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job? So the attention now, after God would have questioned him, where was he? And, uh, Satan explained that the, the God is now about to channel the attention of Job. Sorry, the attention of Satan to Job. Now, Satan wasn't checking for Job prior to this. God is now putting this, this light, this spotlight on Job. Now, now watch this now. Remember, now at this point, the only human in this story, the only flesh and blood in this story is our brother uh, Job. Okay? Now, watch this. Now, and, and before I go any further, let me also be clear here. The, the conversation or the dialogue between God and Satan, Job, the human, is not privy to this, okay? God and Satan, as well as the sons of God, are up in the heavens. But God and Satan, all spiritual being, beings, are, are having a conversation about Job, who is, uh, at that point, a resident of the earth, Okay? Okay, so verse 8 says, And the Lord said unto Satan, thou hast, hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect or a complete and an upright man, one that feareth God and eschews evil. All right? Now let's be clear. The word perfect there for Job speaks of one who is basically honest, not perfect as in he never sinned or never did wrong. All right? And of course, it would say that he made the sacrifices and atonements for his children and himself. So that clearly tells you that he messed up also, right? So it says that a perfect and an upright man, one that feared God and eschews or turned away from evil. Listen to verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Do Job fear you for nothing? Or is Job commitment to you via refraining from evil? Do you believe he's just doing that for doing sake? So verse 10 of Job chapter 1 says, listen carefully, this is Satan still speaking, because Satan is about to reveal to us a revelation. Had we not read this prior, sorry, if he never mentioned this, we wouldn't have known this. So Satan in his response to God, after God uh, putting Job on this pedestal, and Satan is saying that he, he, there's a reason why, there's a reason why Job is doing what he's doing. So verse 10, where Satan is speaking, has thou not made, listen, has thou not made, has thou not made a hedge about or around him? Okay, who's speaking here? Satan. Who is Satan talking to? God. So he's saying, God, the reason why Job is so committed and faithful to you is because you have a hedge around him. Now, the reality is this hedge is not visible. Now, let's see, we're going somewhere now. Okay, this is one of the invisible uh, layers of protection that every child of God has. While it's not visible to the natural eye, it is quite visible to the powers of darkness. And this hedge is so esteemed that even Satan knows that once he spots that hedge, only so far he could come to the man or woman who served the living God. Boy, I'm talking to somebody today. i talking to somebody today. Oh, yeah, man. Oh, yeah. You all listening to this, right? Verse 10, Satan, Satan is speaking. He's responding. He says, God has not you. Didn't you make a hedge about him? Now, now listen what I said to you earlier. Because, okay, let me use me. I am a believer of Jesus Christ doing the work of the Lord. So I'm automatically, I have a hedge around me. But this hedge is not limited to me, okay? My wife, Deidre, our children are also recipients of this umbrella of protection because of my commitment to God, okay? So in verse 10, he says, Has thou not made a hedge about him? Or did you not put this invisible cage around him and about, listen, and about his house, not just him, and about his house and about all that he have on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hand and his substance is increased in the land or his wealth is increased. Now, now, now if that ain't powerful, you tell me. 
The scripture is saying to us that as a, a, a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, the or God, the benefit, one of the benefit is this initial layer of protection. Though invisible, the power of it is that when Satan sees it, because he could see this invisible protection that you cannot see, I cannot see it, but it does not negate the fact that it's not there, or it's clearly there, so much so that Satan now begins to give this this full uh, 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 defining of this thing or explaining or exposing it. He is only serving you because you got the boy protected. And you're not just protecting him, you're protecting his house, meaning his family. And everything that concerns Job or anything that is remotely related to him, the umbrella of invisible protection also encompasses those things. My God, my Lord. My God, y'all need to stop right now. Pray right now. Father, I thank you for your invisible protection. I thank you for the hedge around me. That the, and we're going to learn in this that the only way, the only way that this hedge could be tampered with, whereby the enemy could come in, then the one who's being protected, he, he or she would have to be the one to cause that to happen, to give the enemy the right to, to afflict them. And I'm going to show you all of that in scripture today. But for right now, for right now, I don't care where you are in life. I don't care what you're going through. Even if you are in a prison cell right now, there is a hedge of protection, an invisible divine protection around not just you, but also your seed, your children. But you see, you you worrying about the children, you're worrying um, the daughter's going away to college or your son and, and Lord, you hope nobody take advantage of him and all this nonsense. Why are you there? Why don't you go to the scripture and say, Father, I thank you for the hedge that not only encompasses me, but this, this divine benefit that I have as a follower of you has extended this protection to my household and all that concerns me. My God, I love this. Has thou not, verse 10 of Job 1, has thou not make a hedge about him, about Job? Didn't you put some protection around him, God? So much so that it's all about his, his household or his family and about all that he have on every side. Not only that, God, you have blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. My God, God, listen to this. He's saying, not only is this protection protecting you, but because of your commitment to God, God will automatically increase you, advance you. You ain't got to play no games with people life. You ain't got to tell them so no seed. God says, as long as you are committed to me, I have an obligation to put the CIA all around you to protect you, the FBI, the PI, whoever else. All protection, invisible though, is on you. But you by faith must believe. So when you say no weapon form against you shall not prosper, they're not just words. Oh, no, no, no. They cannot prosper because there's a hedge around you if you're living right to sustain that protection. And we will get in a little bit, okay? So you got to know, you got to know your liberty and benefits in Christ. I got a teaching coming up on that. Uh, hopefully by on starting that on Saturday. You got to know what your benefits are. You got to know what your liberties are. See, because now, now you can move effectively and watch this confidently. Okay? So, so the scripture goes on to say here in verse 11, Satan now says, I guess, Satan says in verse 11, he says, but put forth thine hand now and touch all that he have. Who is he? Still talking about Job. And he will curse thee to thy face. So uh, Satan is advising God, right? Excuse me, he says, okay, God, clearly this man is uh, serving you because you're protecting him. Anybody would do that. You're backing him. You're supporting him. So he's committed to you because of that. So Satan is now challenging God by saying, okay, you will see what Job is really made up of will remove that protection from him and let me have my way on him. And you will see if he wouldn't curse you. huh? You will see. So what he's basically saying is that built into Job is a spirit of ungratefulness that if you take these uh, 
benefits from him, you will really see what Job is all about. So listen to verse 12 now, because it's now about to explain who is the one, not only who has instituted this protection, which we already know uh, Satan admitted to, but the one, th this is the one now who is going to give the right to the enemy. In this case, though, to afflict Job by, by giving him, by, by lowering this protection. So listen to verse 12. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, I'm giving you permission now, Satan. Behold, all that he, which is Job, have is in thine power, in your power. Let me tell you, I love this. This is so powerful. God, I thank you. I hope these people understand what's happening here. Verse 12 is revealing clearly to us. God, who is in control of all things and in control of all spiritual protection around us, right? He's in control of that. What is saying here is that I don't care who is working sorcery against you. I don't care who's conspiring against you on the job. I don't care who has snuck into your files on your computer and sent out e nasty emails to other people to, to, to cause you to get in problem. Don't let your focus be there. Where, where your focus should be, Father, I believe, according to your word, that there's a protection around me. And one of two things is happening if you allow this embarrassment or this defeat or whatever. One of two things has happened. Either one, I have violated your law, not repented and gave the enemy the right to come in to do what he do. Or I'm still protected, but you allow this only for something greater in my life. But this has to happen, which is a part of the formula to give me what you've already assigned just for me. See, you, you got to, you cannot limit, you cannot or put God in a box or God is only God based on your knowledge of God. We can never get the full concept of God. Hence, we cannot look at something that, has, that, that didn't benefit us seemingly and say this couldn't be God. When the scriptures are clear, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18, that we must give thanks in all things for this is the will of God. It may not seem so at the time, but this is the will of God concerning us in Christ Jesus. And we just got to trust the process and trusting the process and the best way to trust it is you got to ensure, am I following the rules? Am I following the protocols, okay, of God to ensure a God-determined end result at the end of this, whatever I'm going through right now, all right? So as you would see in verse 12, Satan said, and the Lord said unto, sorry, and the Lord said unto Satan, behold, all that he have is in your power only, only upon himself, put not thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Only see, only God could do this. Only God could give him the right. But God is doing that or allowing whatever Satan is about to do. Your Job, you're living right. Job, you're doing everything right. I can let Satan come in this one time, but only to prove to Satan that I already know you can stick to me no matter what. It's only to show him something and for the readers in the future of this story so they will benefit from But make no mistake, I got, I'm in control. I am the one calling the shots here. I am the one, as you can see, Satan had to come to me. Satan not to get permission from me to afflict you. He couldn't do it arbitrarily. He couldn't do it on his own. He, he, he again, more empirical evidence that Satan and God are not on equal. No, no. Say, okay, Satan, I'll give you an opportunity because I know the end from the beginning and I know Job, I know Job. Job isn't serving me because I've made him wealthy. Job isn't serving me because I've given him homes and wealth and, and all. No, Job, Job like those necessities and convenience of life but the source of Job's love is towards me, his savior. And these other things that I've given him are just conveniences for him to live a better life. But his, his confidence is in embedded in things. Oh, I love this. I, and this is an awesome story so that you could now begin to recalibrate. and Stop worshiping things and money and jobs and positions and recalibrate back to the source whom has caused you to have those things. And what is that? That is the all, all, almighty God, right? So, 
I want us to go into another scripture uh, that is really a parable and it's going to shed more light on this divine invisible protection uh, that God has afforded everyone that will follow him. So let's go to Isaiah or Isaiah, however you, you pronounce it. And let's go to chapter five. All right. Isaiah chapter five. And we're going to read from verse one to verse five. Okay. Isaiah chapter five. I'm going to read from verse one uh, to verse five. I don't know about you, but I love the scriptures, man. I love this. I love this. Some days I ride up on the beach and just sit down and just read these beautiful passages of scriptures that are so filling to my spirit, man. I love it. I hope you fall in love with the word of God like that. Now listen to this. Isaiah 5 verse 1. This is a parable. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it, circle that word, fenced it, because literally it means he placed the hedge around this vineyard. Okay, that's important to know. We're coming back to that. So verse 2 of Isaiah 5 says, And he fenced it uh -huh, and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choice vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Mm, something right there. Verse 3 of Isaiah 5. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. Verse 4. What more could I have done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. This is the same making no sense. Listen to verse 5. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard, because it's not producing what I intended it to produce, even though I've put everything in that vineyard and put a hedge around them or a fence to protect them from outside forces of any kind of opposition. I've done everything for this vineyard to produce, but, it, it, but it's not producing what I intended it to do. So in verse 5, he says, and now, go, and now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge. Watch this. Watch this, because this hedge now is in relation to verse 2, where it mentioned the word fence. It's the same thing. All right. He says, I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up and break down the wall thereof, which is also a hedge, and it shall be trodden down. Okay. Now, just let's jump to verse 7, because it's now going to explain the parable. He says, for the vineyard, the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression of the righteous, of the uh, behold, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. Now, let me explain this to you. This parable is talking about God and the children of Israel, right? But God is using this parable, or such as in this analogy, to show them what, what, what went wrong here. He says, I, God, created this vineyard, which would have been the children of Israel. So the children of Israel is the vineyard, and God is this farmer tending to. So he says what he did is that he put a hedge around Israel, and he removed all the impurities, which he called the rocks, stones, pebbles, and stuff. He removed all the impurities, and he gave Israel everything they did to produce good and proper grapes. But he realized that over time, this vineyard, which is symbolic of Israel, they were not producing good grapes. They were not doing justice and feeding the poor and helping the lame and, 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 and following his commandments. So he says, okay, as a result of that, I'm going to punish them. And how am I going to punish them? I'm going to remove my hedge of protection from around them. You see, just like with dreams, like I always told you, a parable is just giving an understanding of a greater spiritual implication. That's all it is. So God is showing, I'm showing you that this fence or this wall or this hedge 
is something spiritual that I had around you, Israel. I favored you. I protected you. I gave you food. I gave you everything. And the, and the only exchange I wanted you to do was to be righteous and fair and to live upright and to f- obey me and worship me and have me and me alone as your one and only God. So I gave you everything that you needed to be successful in the end. But instead, even though I gave you everything along with the protection, you did everything contrary to what I said. Hence, now you cannot produce what I intended you to produce. So what is the punishment? Let's go back to verse 5. Let's go back to that. He says, and now go, I te-, he says, and I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. What is the first thing? What is the first thing God is going to do? He's going to remove his invisible protection. I'm reading it right here, verse 5 of uh, Isaiah chapter 5. He says, I will take away the hedge thereof. And when I take this away, listen, he says, it shall be eaten up and break down the wall thereof, and I shall be trodden over. So what is he basically saying? Well, the purpose of a hedge, a wall, or a barrier between two things is to prevent that which is on the outside from coming in on the inside. And for the most part, it will be uh, your enemies or impurities or things that are not beneficial. The things on the outside of that protection are things that are not beneficial for the contents on the inside. So a barrier is put in place such as a hedge, like in the case with Job. Job, you're, you're living right. You're doing the right thing. I'm gonna, so, so I'm going to put everything in place for you to continue to live right, for you to continue to do the right thing. So when Satan sees you or his evil spirits, they'll be like, I will really rip this dude apart. But oh, according to the law, when I see this hedge, the most I can do is hope that Job go against God. Hope that Job mess up here. So now there will be a kink in his hedge giving me the right to now Take advantage of that if he doesn't repent. By talking to somebody that this is so juicy today. So as you can see in this parable, it's now giving us a more visual as it relates to Job uh, 1 verse 10 in terms of this hedge that we never knew of until Satan spewed it out through his conversation uh, with God. Now, I said to you earlier that this hedge, which we've also seen in this chapter, the hedge can be tampered with. But the tampering of the spiritual hedge is not from the enemy. The enemy cannot uh, knock down the hedge. He, he doesn't have that authority. The, the, the power of that hedge, or the, the, sorry, the tampering of that hedge lies with the one in whom the hedge is protecting, okay? So let's look at some more scripture. Let's look at some more scripture uh, to support this, okay? Okay. Uh, Let's look at Ecclesiastes 10, verse 8. Let's look at Ecclesiastes, and we're going to look at verse 10, chapter 10, sorry, sorry, and verse 8. And I love this. Listen to what it says. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 8 says, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. I like that. We're not focusing on that, but let me just give you some highlight there. This is another reason why you shouldn't be sending people who are sending witchcraft at you and you pray and say, Lord, I send it back to them. No, according to the scripture, if they're undermining, causing trouble or digging or causing problems for you, he said, don't worry about them. The very ditches that they're digging to put you in, automatically, if you're living by God's laws, they will fall into it. You have nothing to do with it. Why? Because vengeance belongs to God. But here's the part. We want part B. So it starts off by saying, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And whoso breaketh the hedge, mm, whoso breaketh the hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Serpent here is symbolic of the enemy of the kingdom of darkness. But how could the one who has the hedge around him break it? Going against the laws of God. Going against the laws of God, because the by doing the laws of God, the hedge is fueled. There's no reason for God to move it if you're doing the laws. Had Israel obeyed God in 
uh, Isaiah 5, you see, that was sustaining the hedge. When they didn't obey him, he says, I'm going to take my hedge. I'm going to remove the protection I had. And then listen what he says. It'll be thrown over, meaning that whatever was on the outside that couldn't come in can come in now and destroy you. Christians don't tell me. I don't care if they work in witchcraft. I don't care if they go to Sangoma for me. I don't care what kind of thing they plant in my yard. No, you must care. You must care if you're violating the laws of God, even though you're a Christian, because it's the only way your hedge can be tampered with. So you cannot be fighting witchcraft and witchcraft. You cannot be sending prayers of witchcraft or curses that's been sent to you. You're saying, you, I send it back to the sender. You are violating the laws of God because you are supposed to bless those that curse you. So it has only been the, the, the hedge or the, the attack of the enemy is on you because there's something going on in your life that is contrary to the word of God that directly tampers the hedge that's around you. I tell you, people say to me all the time, Kevin, is, I get all kinds of emails every day. Every time I open my emails, any one of them, I could expect at least one email will say someone is working witchcraft on me, or I believe someone sent a curse at me, or I feel something moving. If you're a believer, if you're following the laws of God, and according to the protocol, I have to, no disrespect to you, I have to ask you, what is it that you are doing that's complying with the enemy's camp that has, unbeknown to you, given him the right to afflict you? I'm listening. I, 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 all I can hear is crickets. <laughs> I, I, tell me. If you are doing what is right, if you are following the, not tradition, not, not, not because you say no weapon formed against me shall prosper, anger prosper. It don't work that way. Are you following the laws? What did you do? I know you come to me, Kevin. Oh, Kevin, let me tell you something. I see stuff moving about in my house. And I, as a woman of God, I just uh, do the midnight prayer, the 3 a.m. prayer to knock down these witches and wall. I, I, I hear all of that. I hear that. But why are you doing all of that and all of these spiritual, supernatural, negative things are happening to you? Why? That don't make no sense. Why? Because according to the law, you, there is something, there's something going on with you that the enemy, is, who is the serpent, he said, if the hedge be broken, the serpent will bite. So the enemy said, ah, oh, I got you. I got you, Kev. You're watching porn. Nobody looking, so you think you... Now, while they may not see you, remember now, I see spiritually. And God can't stop me because there's his laws. And here it is, you didn't repent. So while I'm coming in here now. Now, from that pornography, I want you to cheat on your wife. I, I can take you from sin. To, and you better repent because if you don't repent, this only can get worse. Because there's a kink in your hedge which give the enemy the, the, the loophole to sneak up in there and deal with you. Simple as that, All right? Now, let me, let me prove this to you. Let me prove uh, Ecclesiastes 10, verse 8, in the latter part, which says that it, whosoever break it, the hedge, who, whoever can break it, the enemy got the right to come in. So if I am protected by God, which I know I am, but if I decide to go and commit uh, sleep with other women and, and go do all kinds of th things that are against the word of God. And let me be clear, not only am I putting my life at risk to the enemy, but remember who this protection protects me as a child of God, who, who all the umbrella covers, my household, my children, and all that concerns me. So I am not only tampering with the protection of me, but with my wife, our children, our everything that we own, the enemy has a shot at it now. So what am I saying? I can beat this for every time. No amount of seed could protect you. Your pastor covering, he, he himself, he himself, by saying that he could cover you, he himself is tampering with his hedge because he's trying to put himself in the place of Jesus Christ who's the only covering for you. 
But anyway, so let's go here now to Proverbs. Let's go to Proverbs. And we're going to go to verse, Proverbs chapter 26, verse 2. Okay, now remember, coming off of Job 1 and 10, Job says, God, you have a hedge around Job, but it's it's invisible. We can't see it, all right? Then we come there to Ecclesiastes 10, verse 8, and it says that when if that hedge is broken, it is only broken. Whoever tampered with it, which will be the, the one who it's protecting, it says that the enemy will not take a shot at him. So meaning that as long as the hedge isn't broken, the enemy cannot touch him. The enemy can tempt him. Excuse me, but temptation is totally different from violating the laws of God. You're being tempted, but when you act upon that temptation and you sin, now you better repent. If not, then the hedge has been tampered with. You're leaving it open for the enemy to take a shot at you, right? So in Proverbs 26, verse 2, because it supports Ecclesiastes 10, verse 8, it starts off, uh, it starts off by saying, as the bird by wandering. And as the swallow, which is also a bird, by flying, it's giving this what they call, uh, in Hebrew, it's called parallel poetry, where it, it, it gives a comparison to two events to bring about the point. So as a bird by wandering, as a swallow by flying, so so the curse causeless shall not come. So let me explain it. Let me take it a little deeper for you. So a bird is flying, any type of bird, right? Now, when that bird come to land, it's coming either to land to rest or to find food that it wants to, to eat. It's meaning that the underlying understanding is that there is a cause as to why this bird seek uh, uh, to land or to eat. So the comparison is it says it's the same as a curse. It says, so the curse causeless, meaning just like how those birds only will touch down to eat or to rest. He says, so it's a, a curse. A curse cannot come upon you unless there's a cause. So if you say to me, Kev, I go going crazy in this place. These people working witchcraft 24-7 on me. I can feel the curses coming. Why? Don't let's focus on them because they can only do what you allow them to do through your disobedience or violation of the laws of God. Because other than that, by, per, by doing the laws of God, you your hedge is fortified. You are protected. So I'm confused when you say to me, child of God, that you are being attacked viciously. Why? Why? Why are they not attacking other people and they're only attacking you? Let, let, let's see. What is the common denominator? Maybe, maybe because they're truly living right and you're living a form. See, I don't see the fornication. I don't see the lies. I don't see the deceit. See, you could fool me. I don't know all of that. I'm not all knowing. But what I do know because I know the law is that if it's happening to you, particularly on a consistent basis, then there is something going on in your life that is contrary to the word of God, which now gives the enemy the right to descend upon you. What made God remove his protection off of his vineyard, which was symbolic of Israel in Isaiah 5, because they were not following his rules. He says, I'm going to remove my protection. And the only reason why protection is put in place, a hedge, a wall, whatever, is to protect you from what's on the outside trying to come in. But God said, I ain't going to do it no more. I'm going to let them trod nobody can come in there and deal with you because you refuse to listen to me. I'm talking to somebody today. Unforgiveness. <laughs> you know I was coming here. Unforgiveness is the key to unlocking your padlock of spiritual protection. That's right. If you choose to hold unforgiveness, you choose to make up in your mind that you're going to be vindictive, you can get this person back, and all of this hate and bitterness... This is the key. You say, hey, hey, Satan, come here, come here. Satan, I've been watching you for years, and I've seen you at a distance trying to figure out how you're going to get into my life. Satan, no need to, to, to seek strategy anymore. Here, here's the key. Here, take this. Here, this is the key 
of unforgiveness. I can't stand my boss. I hate my wife and I hate them. I I got some resentment for what's happened to me in the past now. You, you, you don't got to wait to, for me to mess up here. Here's the key of unforgiveness. Now you unlock the hedge that God has around me and you, you have a field day on me, Satan. That is basically what you're doing. 99.9% of the people that I counsel with who go in through these ups and downs and all this stuff, these are believers. And they always say to me, Kevin, I did the fast. They, they like to, to, to pronounce that. Kevin, because to me, you how, how, if you're doing that and it's not working, there's something wrong with you. Ain't nothing wrong with God. God is a God that cannot lie. Something is wrong with you. 99.9% .9 of the time, listen to me carefully, 99.9% .9 of the time, because they're saying, Kevin, I'm not fornicating. Kevin, I'm not committing adultery. Kevin, no liquor has ever touched these lips. I am the wife of one husband. I'm the husband of one wife. They think these are some big tickets. I don't know why. Kevin, let me tell you something. I don't go to no club. I don't even watch BET. I don't watch none of those worldy tanks. Okay, good. I hear you. But you hate your sister and you haven't spoken to her for the past 15 years. Well, Kevin, she did something to me and I don't hate her. I just don't want nothing to do with her. Okay, so she came here right now. Would you kiss and love and take her for lunch? I don't know about all of that. <laughs> so that's the key then. That's the key that you gave Satan from the day you decide not to forgive your sister. You, you don't realize this, but you say, hey, Satan, now whatever you want access to my life, just in case I'm not here, here, here's the key. You have your own key to my life now. So you take that key, one forgiveness, and whenever you feel like coming in my life and jacking up my finances, messing up my relationship, and just making a total mess of my life, remember now, now I got a key too. But now, and just in case you lose, I got another one. So you can always come back and I will give you another one. So that's basically what you're doing. So what you do is you say, well, Kevin, I'm not telling lies. I'm not having sex with other people's wives or husbands. You know, the big ticket things. That's what they look at. They train to think that way. And really, it's the visible sin. So in, they've been taught that if I'm not doing the visible sin, now mind you, they're probably doing it privately, you know, sneaking the little pieces here and there. But because you don't see it, because we're trained to give an appearance of godliness. Okay, once we give the appearance, so, don't, so now we come and sit with Kevin and let's, let me let's lie to him a little bit and tell him everything breaking out on the back end, even though we just go to 5 a.m. prayer meeting every morning, we've been doing the 40 day fast and I don't care what you're doing because what you're basically trying to tell me is God mess up on this one because you're doing everything and things still in work. It's you, man. You could never convince me on that. I've lived long enough to know that you're talking nothing but heap of dung. I don't believe you. Go get safe. It is you. Now you could get mad all you want, but when you're done being mad, Satan still got the key for your life. If I were you, I'd try to take it back by obeying the laws of God, repenting. And now fixing things with those, whether they wronged you or you wronged them. The problem here is you have resentment. You have unforgiveness. So you got to deal with that. So if you don't deal with that, you know, Satan will never give you that key back. You will never get it back. So the scriptures are clear. A curse causeless, Proverbs 26 verse 2b, cannot descend upon you. In so much words, the hedge of protection cannot be tampered with unless there was a cause for it to happen. So don't you try that. Get that self-righteous dung garbage out of here. So you need to do an introspect on you. But you don't got to do that. You know exactly what time it is. You, you, you toting the unforgiveness for your sisters, for your brothers, for your mother who been dead for years now, but she treated you different and you still got it in for your dead parent. And you're wondering why Satan is in and out of your life at will. Well, he can only do it if you gave him the key. Scripture. Scripture. So watch this. Let me show you some other... Uh, layers of protection. Let's look at uh, Psalms 34, verse 7. Look at Psalms 34, verse 7. Psalms 34, verse 7. Listen to this. Invisible, another layer of protection. It says, The angel of the Lord encamp or circle around them that fear him. Who's him? The Lord. And what do they also do? They are also the ones delivering you. 
So they have an assignment, as long as I follow the laws and, 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 and submit to God rules, it says that even though I don't see, now this is aside from the invisible hedge, you know, this is just another layer of protection now. Aside from this invisible hedge that we cannot see, but very much there, and Satan and his crew must respect it, whether I'm aware of it or not, God says there's also this single angel assigned to every believer that is surrounding us, probably even ensuring that this hedge is intact. And it says not only that, they are the ones who are now delivering us, but I can't see them. Scripture, not the layer of protection. Scripture, I'm not, I'm not making these things up. It's another layer uh, uh, of protection, right? Now, this is powerful. This is powerful because what I'm about to show you, I'm about to give you three scriptures, and I use them quite often, that's going to show you how you, how you're the one tampering with the hedge, how you are the one that says, when God says, hey, man, look, if you ain't going to stop, if you don't stop disobeying me, I can move this, you, be, you need to stop. But you continue doing what you want to do. You continue with your unforgiveness. You continue with your pettiness. You continue speaking to people in any kind of way and treating them like dogs. God's had enough for you, man. So let's look at this. Let's look at Psalms. No, before we go to Psalms, let's go back to, yeah, Psalms, Psalms 91. You know this one, Psalms 91. I quote this all the time. Psalms 91, verse 11 and 12. Listen to this now. For he which is God has given his angels, invisible beings again, this plural now. So watch what you got now. You got the hedge of protection that you can't see. Then you got this one specific angels that the Bible says surrounding you, watching over you to deliver you. Aside from that, now he's saying, I'm giving my angels plural. This is aside from the other two layers. I've given my angels plural, more than one, charge of a command over thee. And listen what they're supposed to do. To keep thee in not some, but all of thy ways. Verse 12 says, it says that day, who's the day? These angels shall bear or hold thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. So you're walking down some pavement and your shoe heel got hooked in it and you're about to collapse and hit face down. Somehow you caught up. According to what I'm reading here, that was a no luck. The Bible say the invisible forces will gather you in their arms. Why? Because they are commanded to keep the word. Keep the means to guard you in all your ways. My God. Boy, I love that here. Yeah? <laughs> I used this example one time. Remember years ago when you wasn't faithful to your boyfriend or to your girlfriend or whatever. And your partner going to work and you trying to make a ghost move around the corner to your side piece. But when you went outside, the car was flat. You're mad. So you fix the tire. I say, okay, again, then now all of a sudden the squall of rain come, you can't even see. So you go back praying to God that this rain go down. Now you're supposed to be a believer now. So you go to your side piece. But all of a sudden now the rain down, you go in the car and the car wouldn't start. And you say, Lord, what's going on here? I trying to go commit a felony in the spiritual realm, but it's look like the devil busy, not knowing that the angels of the Lord trying to protect you. Y'all remember uh, uh, Balaam? Balaam, God said, do not, and we can talk about him next, do not go down to those people. He keep going to God, nagging God, says God, he on the donkey. He cannot see his, and the, the angel with the sword, he cannot see it. The angel that was supposed to protect him but because of his disobedience, it's just waiting to take his head off. The donkey could see it. The donkey is pulling back and Balaam just uh, just healing the donkey and its side to go forward. And the donkey pull it back and say, haven't I been good to you all this time? Donkey talking to him now. And then he saw, his eyes were opened spiritually and he saw an angel with a sword waiting on the command of God to remove his head from his shoulders. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Please, read your Bible. Don't take what man say. Read the scriptures. Read the scriptures. So the Bible says here in verse 12, they shall bear, who's the, the angels? They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. So you see, you see these levels of protection, and it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there, and we're going to go, further into more protection. So, so far what we have, we have the invisible hedge of protection. That's number one. 
uh, according to Job chapter 1, verse 10, then according to Psalms 34, verse 7, we have that one angel who is encamping or surrounding us to deliver and protect us. That's another layer, all right? Then Psalms 91, verses 11 and 12, then you have a cadre of angels, uh, which the Bible referred to in Hebrews 1, verses, I think, 13 and 14, as ministering spirits or serving spirits sent forth from heaven to minister or to serve us what is to salvation, all kind of protection you got. Now, okay, with that said, I want you to see now how this layer can be tampered with, these layers of protection. So let's go again to Psalm 66, Psalm 66, and we're going to look at verse 18. Psalm 66, verse 18. Now listen to what it says now. It says in verse 18, if I regard iniquity, if I regard hate, if I regard bitterness, if I regard unforgiveness, vindictiveness, spitefulness, whatever, if I regard or retain that in my heart, what, what's just going to happen? The Lord will not hear me. What does that mean? Same thing what you've been coming to me with. Kevin, Kevin, I don't know what else to do. I gave to the poor like you said, Kevin. Oh, my God. I give. Kevin, I give my last. I would give the shit off my back. Kevin, I fast. I prayed. I did all of that. But she never told me she haven't spoken to her sister in 15 years. And which she don't know, she activated the law, one of the laws of iniquity, according to Psalm 66 and 18. Now, you're doing all of that. But the scripture says, but if you regard iniquity in your heart. Now, Kevin can't see that. And you're glad Kevin can't see that so you could lay the victim rule on Kevin. But Kevin is not silly because Kevin is a lawyer of the law. Okay? So I, I don't need to know what you're doing, but I know you're doing something because God's word cannot lie. So the scripture says if you regard or retain a whole iniquity, and what is iniquity? The abuse of sin, lawlessness, rebellion. Kevin... I don't know why people take advantage of me. I mean, all I do is good for people. I don't get it. I mean, I would give them whatever they want. I'm a cheerful giver, but why are you not telling me you are also a hateful, vindictive person? Why are you not telling me that not only do you not like your sister, who you haven't spoken to in years, but your nieces and nephews, by her, you don't speak to also and you hate them. Why didn't you tell me that? So we could easily diagnose your situation for deliverance. You ain't telling me because you want to lay, you clearly you're trying to prove God wrong. But it ain't happening here. We we'll try somebody else, all right? So if we regard iniquity in our heart, God will not hear us. Now let's go to Isaiah again. Let's go to Isaiah again. I love the scriptures here. Yeah? Let's go to Isaiah 59. Uh-huh. And we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 2 because we're, we're showing now the, the components that that tampers with the hedge. And it can only be happening by the one whom the hedge is protecting. They would have to engage these things, okay? So we're going to see right now, according to Isaiah 59, verse 1 and verse 2, Behold, the Lord hand is not shortened that he cannot save me. God, why are you not saving me? I'm crying out to you. I'm fasting. I'm giving to the poor. Behold, the Lord hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither his ear heavy or clog that he cannot hear you. So these are not the reasons why God is not intervening in your situation. These are not the reasons why God is not only not hearing, but why isn't he responding to me? What is the reason? Verse 2. But your iniquities, your lawlessness, your rebellion, your defiance to the word of God, your presumptuousness, I am not doing this the way God told me to do it. But your iniquities have separated or put a petition between you and your God, uh-huh, what else? And your sins have caused him to hide his face from you that he would not hear you. So God says, okay, I've given you chance after chance. I told you to go and repent. I told you to go and make it right. Whether, even though they were the ones that cursed you out, you go to them and show them love, even though it's hard, even though it takes a lot for you to put down your pride. If you want me to work for you, if you want my laws to work, then you got to do it my way. I know they're telling you to bring seed, but I'm telling you that is nonsense. I'm telling you, go. When you come to bring your gifts at the altar, before you put it down, go sort it out with those who there are differences with. Go fix that voice. 
So he says, these are the components that's stopping this. This right here is why the your protection isn't working for you, but it's working for the one next to you. Because they're the difference is they're following the rules that is enabling and sustaining their hedge of protection, and you're not. Hence, Isaiah 5, he says, because you're not producing what I wanted you to produce, clearly because you're not doing the rules, I'm going to take down my wall, I'm going to take down my hedge, I'm going to let those whom I was keeping you from your enemies to devour you now. What you can do now? Let's look at a third one. Let's look at Proverbs 28. Let's look at Proverbs 28. I love this one. And let's look at verse 13. Kevin, I don't know why I'm not prospering. I don't get it. I don't get it, but I'm, I'm fasting, Kevin. Look how much weight I lost. I mean, other than the weight, I mean, nothing else is happening, and, I, and I'm committed. You are? <laughs> okay. Let's see what the Bible says. <laughs> okay, Proverbs 18, 13. He that cover, he that hide, he that conceal his sin. Remember, Kevin can't see what in your heart, but you're still not being frank and saying, Kevin, maybe it could be the unforgiveness I have. Kevin, maybe it could be the evil thoughts I have towards others. You, no, but you're hiding it. And remember, when we hide it, you're activating a law that is going to work against you. Proverbs 28 verse 13 says, He that covered his sin or concealed it shall not prosper, shall not be successful in receiving of the promises that God has made to them. But God isn't the problem here. They are. Scripture. It's not my opinion. All right. So with that said, we're gonna we're gonna because that was pillows. We're gonna we're gonna build now on this infrastructure. So let's go, let's go here to Numbers chapter uh, 20. Where we are now? Numbers 23. Excuse me. Numbers 23. I love this. Numbers 23. All right. Now, just to give some backdrop here, I think you know the story already. Balak and Balaam being in. Balaam used to be a prophet of God at one point. He abandoned that and decided to go into sorcery and so on. All right. Now, Balak was the king of the Moabites. All right. Balak realized that after learning that Israel had just destroyed two of the world's greatest power, uh, Og of Bashan and so on, he was afraid of Israel. So he realized that he could not beat Israel physically. So clearly he was a very deeply occultic spiritual man and he understood the spiritual realm. So he says, I cannot take them out physically. So what I'm, I want to get an advantage over them in that if I could get someone who's into deep sorcery, if I could get a Sangoma or I could get a witch doctor to disable them spiritually, then I would have an advanced advantage over them physically because that's what witchcraft is all about. So the Bible says here, beginning at verse 1 of Numbers 23, and Balaam said unto Balak, now remember Balaam was supposedly the man of God, but of course he, he he's still operating on his gift, but he's on the shady side. And Balaam said unto Balak, Balak is the king of the Moabites. He says, build me here seven altars. So at this point, uh, Balaam, the prophet who was summoned or invited by Balak, the king of the Moabites, he's now over in Moab. So he says, okay, now I'm getting ready to work my sorcery. So the first thing I need to do here, I need you to set up seven altars. And the reason for that is the altars is the place where these spirits are summoned uh, through sacrifice and making covenants so that we could be on one accord, the practitioner and the spirits as to what they want the spirits to do. So verse 1 of Numbers 23 says, And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me here seven ox and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had spoken. And Balak and Balaam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. So the bullock and a ram, meaning because of the sizes and the type of sacrifices they're making, it is determine, determining the rank of evil spirits that they're calling for. Now, if this was a chicken or some small little lizard or something there, these are just lesser spirits. But if they're going to sacrifice a ram or a goat or a bullock or whatever, then they call it on major spiritual powers. All right? So verse 2 again says, And Balak did as Balaam had spoken. 
and Balak and Balaam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. Listen to verse 3. Watch this now. And Balaam said unto Balak, okay, stand by thy burnt offering, that's by the altar, and I will go pre-adventure or suppose the Lord will come to meet me and whatsoever he showed me, I will tell thee. And he went to a higher place. All right, watch this, verse four. And God met Balaam and he said unto him, I have prepared seven altars and I have offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth. So you see, even though he was in the wickedness, he still had the gift of prophecy and hearing from God. So God didn't take that away from him. Unfortunately, he won't live on two sides of the fence. But God still could use him to bring his point about. So it says in verse 5, And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return unto Balak, and thus shalt thou speak. Verse 6, And he returned unto him, and lo, he stood by his burnt offering, he and all the princes of Moab. Verse 7 of Numbers 23, And he took up his parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, hath brought me from Aram, out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, or the children of Israel, and come, listen, and come, defy Israel. Oh, my Lord. Circle that will become back there. Verse 8. How shall I curse whom God had not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord had not defied? Now, isn't that powerful? This is powerful. This, this... Listen, this is so powerful. This is in direct correlation with Job chapter 1. Let me tell you why. After God brought the spotlight on Job, right? He's telling Satan, look at my servant Job. Or look at my servant Kevin. He's doing my will. He's, he's teaching the people. He's not making the gospel about him. He's not. He did not take on the baton of church uh, traditions. Instead, he walked away from that. He's sticking to the word and he's pointing people to me. Uh, Satan says, well, God, Kevin only doing those things because you got a hedge of protection and so on around him. So let me drop down to verse 12. God is now giving the right. Okay, you, you can go. I, I will allow you to touch him, but you can't kill him. Okay? And whatever God says, Satan, could, he, as wicked as he is, he could not defy what God said. He couldn't go against it right? Taking that understanding and bringing it back here to Numbers now, right? Listen to what Moab, sorry, listen to what Balak said. Balak said in verse 8, after putting up all these altars, after calling the spirits, he did call them, but they were limited. They couldn't go beyond that. Why though? Verse 8 of Numbers 23. He says, how shall I curse? How could I disable them spiritually whom God has not cursed? So in order for a curse to run its course, Yes, the individual have to mess up, but mess up to the point where God says, okay, you know what? You're not going to repent? Okay, then I'm going to allow this to take place in your life. So God has to give the final approval, even though this person is doing wrong, even though they're running on. So he says here, how shall I curse? This is the big Sangoma now, Balak. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? If God didn't curse these people, how could I do it? Watch this now. Or how shall I defy whom the Lord had not defied? Now, what I did is I went and I wrote down the definition of the word to, to, to defy. And the word defy means to openly resist or to reject or to rebel against something. So Balaam said here in verse 8, he says, how shall I reject? How, whom the Lord has not rejected or resisted. I can't, what he's saying is that I cannot go above the laws and the principles and the rules of God. If the, if the, if the uh, infrastructure is not set to receive the curse, according to Proverbs 26 and 2, then I cannot, I cannot, as powerful as I am with my son, Goma, witchcraft work, I cannot defy. I'm talking to somebody the other day who's still thinking people working witchcraft on them, and yes, they may be, maybe they are doing it, but you are unknowingly working hand in hand with them when you are going against the laws of God. If you are fighting them 
with witchcraft, like they're fighting you, if you are saying, I send those curses back to the person who sent it to me, which are all against the laws of God, if you are fighting them on a physical level, which is against the laws of God, because we are not to fight against flesh and blood, then the reality is, you ready for this? The reality is you are a co-conspirator to your own demise. You are working along with your enemy to destroy you. Take that. Deal with it. You. Nobody doing nothing to you. You helping them. Hey, hey, hey. You're taking too long to destroy me. Here, have another key. This is the key. I gave you unforgiveness earlier, but this is the key of hate I have towards Kevin. You're still taking it. Let me give you another key now. You, you are unknowingly a co-conspirator to your own demise. Because when we look at spiritual laws, the enemy cannot arbitrarily, the enemy cannot by chance or coincidence attack and be successful. The infrastructure must be set in place on your end or my end. And how does that happen? When I am in opposition to the word of God. He says, okay, you're in opposition? You're in opposition, right? And after I didn't tell you all of it, okay, I'm going to remove my hedge now. I'm going to remove my hedge. So let Satan have a field day now. Let Satan have a field day. Now you can still go about and cry to the pastor and to teacher Kevin and tell them, oh, how things don't work out for you. And you feel like giving up and committing so. But you, you won't tell them all of the story. You just told them the part for them to have pity on you and you won't do. Remember, the fuel behind all of this is that you refuse to commit yourself to the way God tell you to do it. Because you have a right to be angry of what they did to you. And you, you put in your heart, I will never forgive them for what they did. They put me out of a job. My, my, my uh, six-figure salary, they cost me to lose. And I, I vow never to forgive. But I want God to work for me, though. I still want you to bless me. I still, still want you to protect me. God say, no, 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 no. No, see, 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 that protection came as a condition. And the condition was you have to follow my rules, which sustain and enables the protection that I've afforded you. But when you vehemently go against my laws, um, can't work that way. I'm sorry. If I were you, I'd forgive. So listen what the scripture says here. I love this so much here. Yeah? I cannot curse whom God didn't curse. I cannot defy. The word defy means to openly resist. I cannot resist. If God isn't resisting them, then I, I, the infrastructure is not in place for me to curse them. So what does this mean? Israel was doing what was right. Remember, they're up on the mountain. You know, this is uh, Balak and Balaam and the princes of uh, Moab. Israel was down in the valley. They had no idea these guys are trying to project curses on them. But there is a hedge around them. Why? Why is the hedge there? Is the hedge there so it could look pretty, so they could look cute and handsome? No, no, no. There's not. It's there because they're following all the ceremonial laws. They're following the atonement. They're following all of this offering and the tithes and all that they were supposed to, uh, true covenant they're supposed to do, all of that they were doing. So God has an obligation now. God says, okay. Balaam, I told you. Now tell this fool over here, Balak, tell him. You cannot curse what I didn't curse. You cannot defy what I didn't defy. It's showing the sovereignty of God that before tragedy, before good, whatever happened, God has to approve it. And I can assure you, whatever he approved, you could go right down the line that he went according to his laws. That's why I keep telling you, this, this, this satanic seed sowing to circumvent all of this knowledge will never pan out for you. The only person will benefit is the crook who's asking it from you. You will sow seed, sow the, the word of God in you. Do the word of God. That's the seed sowing right there you, you need to be doing, okay? Now, for the sake of time, let's just jump, okay? Let's go to verse 21. Let's go to verse 21 of Numbers 23. Because so far, and just to give you a summary, it would have taken three attempts of setting up seven altars, which is a total of 21 altars, to curse the children of Israel. And in every attempt, it was failure. That doesn't mean that the spirits weren't coming. They were coming to the altar as summons via the sacrifices and ceremonies and rituals that they were doing. However, they could not be projected from the altar down into the valley. There was a full stop there. And it's simply because 
they were following the rules. Who was following the rules? The children of Israel. And how are we going to prove it? Let's look at verse 21. So verse 21 of Numbers 23 says this. He says, okay, let's go to, let's go to verse 18. Verse 18 says, and he took up his parable. Who is this? Balaam took up a parable and said, said to who? Said to Balak, the king of the Moabites, arise up Balak and hear unto me, thou son of Zippor. God is not a God, is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Have he said it and shall he not do it? Or had he spoken and shall he not make it good? Okay. Behold, I, Balaam, have received commandments to bless. And he had blessed and I cannot reverse it. Meaning that no matter how much rituals and ceremonies of sorcery to project curses down in the valley to Israel, because God has already put a stamp of approval that they are blessed people, no type of curse from the pit of hell could affect them. Now, Balaam is about to reveal to him, Balak, why I cannot curse them. Because God isn't blessing them because he wants to bless them. No, 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 no. There's something that they're doing up down there in the valley that God says, because you do this, you're blessed. And therefore, no man can curse you. But what is it that they were doing? But let's look at the last. Let's look at verse 21. But let's go back to verse 20 of Numbers 23. He says, Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he had blessed, and I cannot revoice it. I have received a commandment to bless them. And as a result of that, God has already blessed ED, past tense. He has already done this. So I'm only, I'm only agreeing with what God has already done. And not only that, I cannot reverse this blessing because God put it in place. Why is God doing this for Israel? But let's look at verse 21. He, who is he? God, have not beheld or found uh -huh, iniquity, all right, or lawlessness or disobedience or breaches or violation to his word. God says, I've not found this in Jacob. Jacob is the same as Israel, the children of Israel. I have not found this in them, neither have he seen perverseness. Now, what does perverseness mean? Perverseness, I wrote it down, means deliberate and stubborn unruliness and resistance to guidance and discipline. He said, I've not seen this in them. I've not seen a rejection of my word. I have not seen them fighting fire with fire. I have not seen them retaining hate, bitterness, and forgiveness in their heart. Because these are the qualifiers why I have past tense blessed them. And Mr. Balin, you have no other choice than to bless them. You, you, you can't revise it. And I don't care what devil you call up. It cannot affect these people. Now, isn't that powerful? Isn't that? So you see, you see, our protection is predicated on our commitment to the laws of God and not see it so in, and not some pastor telling you foolishness that if you're not under his covering and all this garbage. Why you want to listen to that mess when we reading the scriptures? He had not beheld iniquity. God did not discover any iniquity in Jacob. Neither had he seen perverseness or disobedience in Israel. The Lord his God is with him. And the shout of a king is among them. Don't you play with me? So it's only confirming. If you are being consistently afflicted by witchcraft, trouble on the job and all this, there's something wrong. Something wrong could be covenants, could be disobedience, could be bitterness, but something is wrong. And as such, God cannot put the stamp of approval whereby you cannot be cursed. So as you can see here, they could not be cursed, not because God favored them or don't touch them. No, 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 no. What did he look for? Listen, he did not discover he did not find any iniquity, meaning that he was looking for it. Let me see now. I won't be fair here. Israel, I'm looking at you, but I also see Balak and his crew trying to curse you. Now, if they have the legal right, which only you can give, and that's going against my law, then I will have no choice than to approve what they're trying to do. But if you are living right and you are obeying me, 
and you are following my laws and not the laws of men, not tradition, not garbage such as covering and all this foolishness, if you're following my divine laws that are located in the constitution of life, which is the Bible, then I don't care what they're trying to do. They could never convince me to allow them to curse you. Hence, in uh, Numbers 23, verse 21, it says, He which is God had not behold or found any iniquity in Jacob, neither have he seen perverseness or deliberate disobedience in Israel. The Lord is, is his. Who says Israel? The Lord is his God. And they have the shout of a king. You see how all of this, now remember, all of this is going on. And Israel down in the valley have zero knowledge of this. Zero knowledge. Zero. I always tell you, there are many people attacking me. There are many people, aside from uh, the things that they say about me, the, the witchcraft, and, and I see it in the dreams. That's why I can tell you that. But they, they, in all of my dreams, I'm defeating them. In all of my dreams, something come and consume them. In all of my dreams, something is destroying them. Is it because of me? In a sense, in that I'm following the rules. So the invisible forces that has been sent to protect me, God, see, God is saying, see, Kevin, I'm allowing you to see what you cannot see naturally. Through this dream, I'm showing you in the spiritual world, these attacks that are coming against you. But as you can see, it's like there's a hedge around you, which is your protection that's protecting you. Let's sway off here just for a little bit. Last week when I did my teachings on pay attention to your dream, remember the last teaching I did on Friday, when I concluded it, the second part, I said, I'm going to give you this personal testimony about this lady that I used to date years ago right, way before I got married, this lady I used to date, and her father I used to dream about these two people every, just about every night I used to dream about them. In every dream, the first dream that I had, I tell you, I was in a church, but the church was dark, but I still could see just a little bit, and it appeared to be a Catholic or some kind of a Anglican church because the roof was like the cathedral ceiling, and I would hear in the pitch darkness these evil, wicked, angry creatures, but clearly they were angry at me. But around me was this, this light, the circumference is like a surrounding me, like a circumference around me, very dim light though, but still it was like about, I'd say it was like about, I'd say it was like about two feet off from me. So wherever I would walk, the light would follow me. Now this light around me was protecting me from these creatures that was in the pitch dark that I could not see. One of the creatures reached forward there, which looked like some hook finger to my sister to scratch me. But the minute it hit that light, I saw the smoke come from it and it immediately pulled back. This girl I was dating, her father, her father, who, who didn't know that I could see him. I could see him clearly in the dark. When I turned around to my back, I saw him. And in the dream, he's communicating with these evil creatures in the pitch blackness that I couldn't see. And they're responding to a language that I've never heard that's emitting from him. And all of the rage and, and all the stuff I was hearing from them, the creatures, whatever he said, he, he was the one that's controlling them. I had another dream about this man. In the dream, he is bloodshot naked. And he is black. He's like about 35 million shades of black. So much so, all his eyeball, every the white part of his eye, all of this was black but he was naked and he was, I saw the girl, she was across from me. She was across from me and I'm dressed as if I was going to do a teaching and I'm on the cell phone holding it just like this. And she is with a cell phone, but we're communicating and she's trying to entice me to come by her. And this was the theme of all of the dreams. Like they couldn't come where I was, but I had in order for them to do obviously what they wanted to do. I had to come where they were never went. Through my right peripheral, I saw her father, blood naked, black. And he's moving like a crab in the dream, all of the motions of a crab. And he's walking past me, but he's like about, I say, 10 to 15 feet away from me. For some reason, where I was, he could not come. She could not come. And not, dream after dream, I'm constantly having where none of them could come where I was. But in most of the dream, they're trying to entice me to come where they were, meaning that I would have to leave my place of protection, which will be agreeing with them, which will not give them the spiritual right to affect me. So why am I telling you this? 
I'm telling you this because God, through the dream symbolically, is showing Kevin, I always had a hedge of protection around you. But Kevin, I didn't put it there because I favor you. You were doing my will. You didn't retain hate. You didn't retain bitterness. You were doing it in spite of. So therefore, Kevin, because I'm a God that cannot lie, because if I said it, I'll do it. If I spoke it, I will make it good. And my word, I've placed my word above my name. Heaven and earth shall pass away before I ever fall on my words, which will never happen. I had an obligation but I was showing you spiritually what I was doing for you that you could not see in spite of them doing the foolishness physically to make you think that they were ahead. No, Kevin. No, they were defeated on every level in the spiritual realm. In the spiritual realm, they were defeated on every level and God was showing it to me. So I'm saying to you, it's the same thing in this situation. And everything they did in the physical realm, this was the proof of it, everything that these jokers were doing, they failed on every level. And guess what? I discovered that there were other people that this girl used to date, other guys who either went out of their mind, lose all of their businesses, all kind of bad stuff happened to them. Why it didn't happen to Kevin? Because Kevin was following the rules. Kevin was following the laws. Kevin was still preaching, the word, doing what he's supposed to do. Get out of here, that garbage. So I ain't telling you what I think. I ain't speaking like some preacher who never experienced these things and just, oh, God is going to turn it around. I see that thing. Get out of here. You didn't experience it, so you don't know what you're talking about. I experience it. And to this day, they will never admit it, but they got a level of respect for Kevin. You know why? Because they know in the spiritual realm, this here, this dude here, this dude real. Oh, he ain't like the rest. In fact, we have to buy, our spirits tell us whom we set at him or not him. Not him. Leave him alone. It could be detrimental. Leave him alone if you know what's good for you. So we go wrap up with this. You know, I get excited. You know, I go. <laughs> that's why I love. That's why you see me. I have a passion for the word of God because I am not just a preacher who preached to make you feel good. I live. I always tell you 90% of what I preach to you, I lived it. Witchcraft, voodoo, evil spirits manifesting while I was completely, I have seen it all. So don't tell me. That's why I don't have time for the one running over garbage who've never experienced these things. They are ignorant to the things of God, and that's why their life represents that. But I lived it, and that's why I could speak from a knowledgeable perspective when I read and study the Word of God and correlate it with my experiences. That's why I love, I love spiritual warfare and giving people the understanding. They know hocus pocus is real. So we can wrap up right here, right? So check this out now. Let's go here now because we can show you the some more armor of protection here. Okay, let me put my stuff here. Here we go. So watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Because we remember so far, we have Job chapter 1, verse 10. Satan exposed to, of invisible protection, which I saw in my dream, but it was symbolic of the light that was around me. The reason why the light was dim in the dream is because at that time, I was not at a high spiritual level like I am now. Nevertheless, there was still a level of protection on me. So just like uh, Satan revealed in Job chapter 1, verse 10, he says, the only reason why Job is serving you is because you have a hedge of protection around him. Then we went to Psalms 34, verse 7, and what does it say? It talk about how uh, the angel, singular, the angel of the Lord, encamp around about those, or circle those uh, that fear God or reverence God, believe in God, and it is these same angels that protect them. Then we went to Psalms 91, verse 11 and 12. We said, I've given my angels charge of you to keep you in all your ways. All, not some, all of your ways. And if you as much as dash your foot against a stone, blah, 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 right? We know all of that. But going back to Job 1 verse 10, we saw where the protection wasn't just limited to Job. Excuse me. He said that not only do you protect Job, but also his household and all that concerns him. So by extension, your children are protected. The evidence of this is also found in Proverbs 11 verse 21. It says, though hand join in hand, though people come together to conspire against you, it says, though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not go unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. I am the righteous. My kids are my seed. God says, listen, because you are righteous, they may not even be living for me, but I have an obligation to protect that which concerns you according to Psalms 138 verse 8. So you got to know the scriptures, man, because you are a lawyer in the realm of the spirit via the scriptures. All right? So all of this protection that we have. Now, we're going to go to the New Testament protection. All right, and we're gonna find that right now. We're gonna wrap up right here in Ephesians. We're gonna go to Ephesians. I love this here. We're gonna go to Ephesians 6. 
All right? Ephesians 6, and then we're going to go to verse 10. All right? I don't know about y'all, but I love in this book. I tell you, man, I, 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 lo I love my gift. I love, when I tell you I love the gift of teaching, I get excited. I get excited to believe. I know you all find this belief, hard to believe. And my earlier years, especially when I was a young fella, I, I was very timid, very fearful. I don't think there was no other human on this planet more fearful than me. You couldn't get me speak in public. Man, I barely want to speak to you one-on-one. -on -one. But the, when it was time for that gift to be activated, and I prayed and I said, Lord, take this, Lord of you, take this fear from me. Lord of you. And I, I remember this prayer. In fact, I can remember where I was at that particular time. I was uh I was going to this uh uh, I was going to do a, an inaugural speech. I was uh, voted in as uh, the council president of uh, Tarif College, right? Just started. They made me the council president. And they told me I would have to give the speech. So I was like, what? And man, I was like, for about a month in advance before it happened. And listen, I was so nervous. Every day I would think about it. I'd be like, oh my God, how I can do this? And I remember the night when I had that speech. And I was just before I walk into the hotel where they were having it in one of the rooms, I said, Lord, I promise you, if you take this spirit of anxiety and fear from me, I promise you, I promise you. I was a Christian then. I said, I promise you, I will preach your word. I will until the day I die. Went inside there, boy, and I was nervous. I'm glad I was. After the prayer, I was still nervous. I was nervous. They call up my, my vice president and she gave her two words. And they said, now the next voice you will hear would be that of Mr. Kevin L. A. U. A. Man, listen, people start clapping and everything, you know? And my heart pounding. And my heart, you could see my heart coming through my clothing. I said, my God, oh Lord. My hand a little shaking. I said, oh Jesus. When I got up to that podium and rest my speech now, and that's the only way I can explain it. It was like a coat of confidence came on me. That, that's the best way I can explain it. In fact, I became so confident, I put the speech, the written speech on the side. I walk in front of that podium, whatever, and I begin to talk to those people in such confidence. My speech, I had, I was put 30, 30 to 40 minutes up there. And I receive a resounding standing ovation. I, I try to help somebody today. I try to help somebody today. God is real. Spiritual things are real. There was no way I could have done that outside of the spiritual help of the God of Isaac, Jacob, and Abraham. From that day to now, because my confidence only increased more as I got more into the scriptures. That's what I was telling you earlier. And wherever I go, and I've traveled this world, I've this gift has taken me to the ends of this planet. Never expected that to happen. And when I stand on a, a, I remember a guy prophesied to me not too long after that. He, I remember him holding my hand and he said, man of God, he said, your voice is going to command the attentions of those who listen to you. This was his word. And he released me. No long story. And as I speak, as I open my mouth, just like now, people will just gather and listen. And it's what I say, and not through me, God using me, it's challenging them. It's making them look at their life and now comparing it with the word of God. What God wanted from me is, hey, look, do not become like where you came from. Do not do what they do. Do not take the baton of these traditions. Do If you want to be successful in your calling, then do exactly what the word tell you to do. And the people I'm putting in your part to speak to, don't you ever ask them. For, and I promise him, I say, I wouldn't. Don't you ask them for no money. Don't you ask them for no, do, don't you ever do that. You just do what I tell you to do. And I will touch them to bless you. I will, there are places you will go where they wouldn't give you a penny, but you thank, you move on because it's all me behind this. That is true fate. And that's why you see me got the principles that I have now when people invite me to come and speak and so on. And like I tell you, they ask me, what you want? What is your honorarium? I say, I have no honorarium. I don't believe in it in the sense that I don't believe you should pay for the gospel. Now, if you choose to bless me, that's a different story. If you choose to bless my ministry, that's a different story. If you choose to bless my wife, that's no problem. But if you expect an invoice from me to preach the word of God that was given to me freely, you're a devil. Get out of here. 
it don't work that way. The only thing I require, you invited me, then I expect for you to take care of the incidentals, the food, and I don't move without my wife, so she got to come with me. Very simple. No big deal. And I have seen through, that's real faith because you're believing the word of God. I have seen as a result of that, the Lord literally take my life and swing it and fling that thing way in the future and put me among people that I would have never, ever been in their company under normal circumstances, who has shown me favor beyond my wildest imagination. I had a man gave me a check one time that took care of my salary at FedEx for two years. Never asked for a penny, nothing of that sort. My two-year salary at FedEx, I receive in less than an hour. Never ask, but stuck to what I believe in. You should never be hustling people of God. You should never demand them to pay tithes, which is not the Bible. You should never extort them. You should never tell them. You should never. If, if you preach in faith, then let it begin with you. If you believe the God that you're preaching about, well, then let's see it in your action. So that's why I'm where that I am. And I have seen the glory, the favor of God, myself and my family, or not here and there on a consistent basis. Why? Because we commit to the laws of God. They, they hate and I do this, you know. They hate because they're trying to say, no, 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 no. Don't, don't listen to him. You got to sow a seed. Show us the scripture. And why is God blessing him? And he's never asking. You are always begging. He is never asking. But God is blessing him. If you try that, you devil. That's why I, I tell you, I despise that because I don't want you to take that road. Don't take that road. Take the faith is believing the word of God. That's real faith. Faith is in because how could this be faith? I, if a thousand people in here and I tell them bring up a hundred dollars, how could that be faith? Faith is I could preach the unadulterated word of God and walk off of that stage, end of story. And if they don't decide to give me nothing, I don't care. I've sown the seed of the word of God in their heart. Now God can have to take care of the rest. That's real faith. But don't come around here. You had a $1,000 seed line and $300 seed line and you forcing these people, twisting up the scriptures and telling God is going to bless them. You don't got to follow what I'm preaching. Just bring your money and God is going to turn it on you. You thief, you liar. And, and let me tell you something. You all know this. When I tell you I have no respect for people like that, I have absolutely none. And you may say, Kevin, why are you so adamant about that? Because I used to be one of those people. I used to be one of those people who used to give and give and give and give and give. Every service, every conference, every big speaker, give, 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 give. Buy oil, buy shofar, buy scarf, all of it I did. I did, I blowed, I do everything. And the worst things got for me. The worst. So that's why when I left the organized church in 2012, God says, do not be, like, do not become like where you came from. And I made a vow. I say, okay, God, I will never beg them for money. I will never hustle your people. I will teach your word and your word only. And I watch. I left when I tell you, I watch my life. To this day, it's still soaring. To this day, to this day, it is still soaring. Every day I look forward to see what, what beautiful thing God is going to do for me today. Why? Because I'm following his law. But anyway, let's wrap up because I can tell you by my testimonies for the entire rest of the year, okay? So in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, but I only tell you this to encourage you. In Ephesians chapter 6, we are about to see some more layers of spiritual divine uh, protection, all right? So Paul, in his letter to the church of Ephesus, listen to what he says in verse 10, beginning at verse 10 of Ephesians 6. Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now watch what he's going to say now. Remember what you have already. You have the hedge. You have the one angel. You have the myriad of angels. All of this protection. But listen what he says now. There's some more protection. He says, put on the whole armor of God. Not parts of it. These are specific instructions. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able. Mm -hmm, this is key now. Because it's showing you that even though you have, this is powerful, even though you have Jesus Christ, even though you are safe, you are, are, are bought 
by the blood of Jesus, you are a member of the body of Christ. It, it doesn't mean that because you are a member of the body of Christ, that 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 uh, the armor is automatically placed on you. No, 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 no. See, the hedge of protection is there automatically. The angels are there automatically, but the armor you have to put on. So let me just jump with the blocks here. <laughs> let me just, I, I, I got to beat this. I got to beat this till you all finally get it. What covering is it that you need from your pastor, from your apostle, from your bishop? What covering do you need? You got the hedge of protection. You got the angels. You got Jesus. You got the arm of God. What make Kevin, make it make sense to me. What the same protection he is being afforded through the same constitution, but he is telling you to be a part of his ministry, this church, this organization, you have to be under our covering. So why is it that I can see the arm of God, the hedge of God, the angels of God, all of this, the protection I have now, but I don't see nowhere in this Bible about your covering. In fact, like I said yesterday, when I do read about your covering, God made it very clear in Isaiah 30 verse 1. He says that you cover with a covering, but it was never of my spirit. Go read, go watch yesterday's message. All right? So listen to what he says here now. Listen to what he says. Put on the whole arm of God. You have an obligation. You're safe. You know Jesus. You're speaking in tongues. You do the watuzi. You flip all over the place. But without this, but listen, listen now, listen what he says, put on the whole arm of God so that you may be able to stand. So if I don't have it on, I am not able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Let's read it. Put on the whole arm of God. He didn't say put on peace because putting on peace of the armor is equivalent to not putting on any of the armor. Simply because the word whole, the, the, the W-H-O-L-E, he's making emphasis. He didn't say put on the armor. He could have said put on the armor. So that could have mean I mean put on my helmet, put on my breastplate. No, it's very specific. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand against the wiles, the tricks and stuff of the devil, the, the undermining, the witchcraft. Put on your armor, he's saying. Now, he's about to get a little bit deeper. He's saying now, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That being the case is basically speaking to verse 11 because he's saying, if we are not fighting human on human, but then he begins to give a hierarchy of what we are fighting, which are spiritual forces. He says, we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Okay. So therefore, this armor cannot be material. This cannot be physical. If God is saying, Kevin, listen, Johnny, who caused you to get fired? Johnny is not the problem. There's an invisible entity around or, or, or with him or, or, or not, at, the, at the back of him pulling the strings to his physical life, but truly he's not your problem. Therefore, Kevin, don't focus on him. So what you're going to do now to deal with the true enemy, I need you to pray the armor of God over you. So when we pray, I pray my helmet of salvation. You pray. So by faith, I believe that there is a spiritual armor. This is aside from my hedge. This is aside from the angels because each one of them have their role because the angels are there, but they will not respond unless, like I did in my teaching earlier today on understanding faith, unless I'm speaking the word of God. So all of these things work in tandem. So the, the protection, even though it's there, there's still an activation that I have to do. In this last one here, he's saying that I must put it on me because I'm not fighting. Johnny is coming after me. But by faith, the spirit that's using Johnny cannot affect me because of this armor, because I'm obeying the word of God and all of this other stuff. All right? Verse 13 says, wherefore, he's repeating it now. This is how important it is. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor. But you just tell me that. You didn't care here? I'm telling it to you because it's very important. I'm telling it to you because many Christians are crushed, believing that because they accept Jesus Christ, that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. If that was the case, then why are you being asked as a believer to put on the whole arm of God? Read, people, read. Read. Again, now you see uh, 
sowing seed cannot put your armor on you. Okay, we can we can tear that up, man. We gotta we gotta we gotta we gotta we gotta get this devil doctrine out of here if you want to succeed in life. Do it God way. God never tell you so seed to be protected by him. Never. And he will never tell you that. Wherefore, take unto you the whole arm of God that you may be able, that you may be able, meaning that you cannot be able to do it if you don't have on the whole armor, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Not when the evil day, not if the evil day come, when, meaning that it's inevitable, the evil day is coming. So he's telling you to be proactive. Armor up now. Wherefore, take unto you the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now he's going to tell you how, how, how this arm is. Verse 14 of Ephesians 6. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, be honest, with the word of God that is, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, in verse 16 now, Ephesians 6, above all, taking the shield of faith, not seed, talking mess, seed sowing, no sowing no money here, the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Seed sowing can't do that. He's telling you what to do. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation or deliverance and the sword of the spirit, which is what? Which is the word of God. All protection, but in this case, it's not automatic. He says, you must put it on. I pray it on. Nowhere did you read in there, when I got saved, the armor of on, the armor of God just jumped on my entire being. You didn't read that, and you will never read that. You are specifically told, you are warned in both instances. He says, now put on the whole. Not, he didn't say a piece. He didn't even say put on the armor. He says, put on the whole armor of God. And in both cases, he says so because this is the only way you will be able to stand against the devil. But Paul, I don't get that. Don't I have Jesus? Yes, Kevin, you have Jesus. That ain't changing anything. But these are the protocols that Jesus put in place. Why do you always try to have a discussion and argument and debate? If God say, put on the armor, why are you saying, but if I have Jesus, I don't have to put it on? Where did it say in the scripture that if I have Jesus, I don't have to put on the armor? You have Jesus. In fact, the only way you could put out, the only way you could qualify for the spiritual armor is that you have to initially have Jesus. So Jesus is saying, while you are here in the earth, while there are invisible forces fighting you, I'm telling you how to be proactive as it relates to the onslaught of invisible beings that are fighting to the nail to destroy you. Armor up. Now, if you want to debate and be a casualty of war, then you go right ahead. But I'm telling you, I've said it to you twice. Put on the whole arm, and I said it to you twice. Why? So now, even though you have Jesus, even though you have a hedge of protection, even though the angels of the Lord are watching and they're commanded to keep in all your ways, even though you have all of that, I am now saying to you, put on the armor so that you will be able to stand against the wiles of the evil one. Take advantage of God's divine, invisible protection. Stop debating scripture. Stop letting people who believe they're smarter than Jesus Christ to tell you some nonsense. Take the word of God for what it says it is, as instructed by the spirit of the God, which is the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. Do not allow people to tell you stuff. If it ain't coming from the scriptures, dismiss them, cut them off. The Bible say, if your right hand offend you, he didn't say play with it with the left hand. He said, chop it off. Take it off. So if someone is telling you something against this word, which is the fuel to keep all of your protection and layers of protection in place, we can have a problem. We can have a major problem. I'm finished right now. Heavenly Father, as usual, I, we are grateful. We are grateful for this same word that has created the heavens and the earth, the same word that has made this divide with the firmament, the same word that when you said, let there be light, let there be grass, let there be animals, 
the same word that created all things visible and invisible. We thank you that we had the opportunity to partake of this divine word today. We thank you that you made us privy to some knowledge that some of us never even knew. We are grateful. We are grateful for all of this protection we have in place. So, Father God, because of this discovery, this revelation, it's another reason why we do not place our, our trust in chariots, trust in horses, in particular trust in men. And your scriptures are showing us that even those like a Kevin that you give us, that give us your word, he is just that, a delivery boy. But we are not to praise and worship him, but all he should be doing and encouraging us to do is to affix our eyes on you. You will reward him for his part. You will give him favor while he's here. But that is predicated on him doing what he was supposed to do. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that I, I, I have committed to directing your people to you. And all of those that are listening to me right now who will be future leaders or who are now current leaders will truly put their faith in the scriptures and not the frailty of mere men. That they will not be bamboozled by the traditions of men believing that a human being, flesh and blood, who have blood running through their veins, whose life is limited to God's control, have authority or any right to cover another human. How? How can they do that? When we would have seen all of the layers of protection that you have put in place and it doesn't cost us one penny. All we got to do is follow exactly what it says. Put on the whole armor of God. I pray right now, Lord, that those listening to me now and those that will listen to this video years from now, probably when I'm even off the scene, that the revelation will come alive in them and give them this uh, insatiable desire to want to commit to your laws and commit to your rules. And they, they want a God and result in spite of the opposition, the physical or even spiritual opposition against them. It is my prayer, Father God, that they do an introspect into their own hearts to say, hey, things are not working out for me, but you know why? Let me, before I blame God, before I blame Kevin, before I blame anybody, let me look inside. Let me see that I deal with that hate. Let me see that I deal with the, the, the unforgiveness. Did I deal with all of the evil, wicked thoughts and evil and wicked imagination? Because the word of God says that, that we must cast out all imagination that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Father God, for endorsing those whom we know good and well, was defying your laws. Lord, we sat in those pews. We sat in those conferences. We sat in those conclaves. And our eyebrows went all the way up because we heard something that we knew was not your word. But we sat there because we honor mere mortals more than we honor you. Father, I am begging you. I am asking you, I am beseeching you to forgive us. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for our presumptuousness. Forgive us for our blatant rebellion against your word. Our defiance that because Kevin said it, pastor said it, bishop said it, even though we read otherwise according to your word, but we made up in our minds that we're going to make the decision. We're going to believe pastor but we're not going to believe you, God. God, forgive us for this blasphemy, for this atrocity, which is now going to affect our children on our silly decisions. Forgive us, Lord, and cause us, recondition our minds, Lord, to, to now make our commitment to doing the, the, the laws of God, the same laws that sustain Israel in the valley when up on Belpior on the mountain, 
the, 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 the Balak and Balaam and the princes of Moab was calling down every evil, calling up every evil spirit to channel them against a group of people who didn't even know that someone was trying to curse them. So what does this tell us, Lord? It doesn't matter what they're trying to do. We don't even have to be knowledgeable of it or aware of it. The only thing we need to know is that we're following your rules because based on that scripture, Numbers 23, as long as we follow the laws of God and you find no iniquity in us, they could never curse us. Never. Because you are obligated to those who are obligated to you. You will honor those who honor you. So, Father, I am grateful. We are thankful for your unadulterated word that you've given me the ability to break it down in such a way that even a child could understand it and walk away with not just an understanding, but to make what has been said here immediately practical in their lives with the expectation of receiving the same result of a job in terms of protection, the same results of the children of Israel, and the same results of those who put on the whole armor of God. So, Father, we bless you. Father, we honor you. Father, we praise you. And we ask these things in the matchless and in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Amen. I thank you guys for sharing another two hours. Some of you say I'm on too long, but look like you like it because you're still here. <laughs> but I, I want to I thank you for listening to this word. Let this word marinate in your heart and probably do like I do sometimes. After this, I'll probably, you know, get some rest or go do some droning, but I come back and listen to it all over again because I myself get revelation from my own teachings. Holy Spirit speaking to me. So I want you to go over it, take the notes, and create a plan where you're going to now commit to doing the laws of God. Until next time, God bless you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen.